My name is John Gastel. I'm a professor at Penn State University in Communication Arts and Sciences, and I study democratic deliberation. Well, the democratic system of government is an idea. It's, it's never really existed. Uh, we have systems that are inspired by democratic ideas, but it can be very useful to talk about those ideas, to really think about what democracy is. So the deliberative theory of democracy is a lot like what you think democracy is, but with a tremendous emphasis on the quality of the talk we have. And getting that idea out there, getting people to think critically about how is it that we really talk about issues, could change the way we govern ourselves. I break it down into two parts. One is there's a very rigorous analysis of some problem oriented toward making a decision. And then the democratic part is that we have very egalitarian, respectful social relationships between us. So if you have those two things, the analysis and the social relationship, you have a democratic deliberative process. As for the different kinds that are out there, it's, it's true. There's so many different varieties of approaches to try to improve the way we talk, to make us more democratic and more deliberative. My own preference is often to have a highly structured process where something like the Oregon Citizens Initiative Review or the British Columbia Citizens Assembly or citizens juries generally, where we have a clear purpose, there's a random sample to degrees, a representative cross-section of some kind or another brought together to work on that clear purpose through a very structured process that lasts multiple days. Now there's all sorts of variations on that. It could be shorter, longer, more or less focused. But those multi-day processes that have a very clearly defined purpose, some sort of question that the citizens have come together to answer, and those processes that bring in outside experts, advocates maybe on different sides of an issue or neutral background experts, those processes I think tend to be the most powerful in terms of producing a very high quality of democratic deliberation and outcomes that can maybe translate into real change. Well, when I think about impact and democratic deliberation, I do sometimes think about the impact on the participants, right? changing their civic attitudes and behaviors. I sometimes do think about whether they might uh, make a recommendation that maybe goes into policy and so on. But I've become a little bit concentrated in looking at those processes where the deliberation actually has some authority. So I studied the jury system for years, kind of the overlooked citizen deliberation uh, institution in this field. It's been remarkable that we haven't said more about juries because here it is, centuries old, deliberating and making decisions. So we don't have to speculate about whether someone's recommendations were taken seriously. Juries obviously reach verdicts and make consequential decisions. Now outside of the jury system, we have participatory budgeting, process after process that actually has institutional power of one kind or another to either decide a question, refer a question to a vote, or actually in the case of Oregon, distribute a deliberative analysis to an entire electorate that then has the authority to make a decision on an initiative. So there have been many processes actually all around the world from Brazil to China to India where citizens have come together to deliberate. Public officials have pledged to be responsive to that deliberation. The deliberation has produced specific choices, whether it's a uh, development project in Kerala, India to build latrines or uh, a new public works project in Brazil um, or in China uh, a different approach to uh, economic development there. In each case uh, you've actually got robust deliberative processes yielding recommendations that become policy. Now I, I can't attest to whether or not the policymakers would have done so anyway without the deliberation, but in the cases uh, like India and so on, we're talking about very specific local project recommendations that get implemented more or less likely as a result of the deliberation. Participatory budgeting, for instance, has come to Chicago, to Brooklyn, and now there's a city in California that's using it. And this is a process where the, the local public gets together, comes up with ideas, evaluates ideas, and votes on ideas for how to spend a portion of the budget. Those are examples of real citizen deliberation and input changing policy. If I was to send a message to skeptics about deliberative democracy, it would be a multi-pronged message. Some of those skeptics are, are members of the general public who have a reasonably low expectation that what they happen to say will be taken seriously by people who pull policy levers. The other comments I would have would be for the people who pull the policy levers. And my message would go like this. To the citizens, I would 
direct them to these highly structured, exceptional deliberative opportunities. And that's exactly what's done when we recruit people to something like a citizen's jury. And they come, and they experience it, and they tend to have a powerful experience of their actual authority as citizens in a self-governing system. It, it works. When you give people this kind of power, they feel it, they know it, and they remember it. In some ways, the tougher audience are the people who pull the levers of power. But I have a message for them as well, which is, if we make our campaign message one of empowerment, true empowerment, where we are actually going to implement things like these deliberative processes, we make that our, our campaign theme, we become the party of empowerment. And you can judge us based on our policy preferences. But if to a degree we push those aside and say our primary preference is to have a more robust democracy, I actually think that political party probably is going to usher in a, a period of dominance. You've seen in Brazil, in India, in Canada, political parties have real success with this message of empowerment that they follow through on. It builds a constituency. People identify that party with empowerment. So, and there is a message for both audiences, but they converge on creating real opportunities for power. It's not a question of perception, of getting people to see the world differently. It's a question of putting in place real structures that are empowering. I do think there are really viable ways of scaling up deliberative democracy from small forums into mass processes. But I think when we do that, we've got to be creative. What's so compelling about the Oregon Citizens Initiative Review is it found a way to couple an incredibly concentrated small group deliberation with a much thinner but valuable mass public deliberation. What they do is have a small body deliberate for a week studying a single ballot issue, write a detailed analysis that goes in the voter's guide, and then that voter's guide goes to every household. And it's a vote by mail state. So you get your ballot, you get your voter's guide, and now you read this page of analysis from your peers. Are you deliberating when you do that? In a way, yes. It's a kind of vicarious deliberation. Is it as intense as a week? No, but you don't have that kind of time, and we don't have that kind of money to pay for it to happen. But that's a powerful way that you can take a small and a large-scale deliberative process, couple them, and potentially transform the way elections are run. When people like me advocate these mini-publics that involve a fraction of a percent of a population, they, they worry that I've sort of missed the point of engaging the wider public directly in the exciting world of deliberative democracy. And my response to that is, is twofold. One, don't underestimate the value of these mini-publics. We've been using the jury system successfully in this country for years, yet the average person uh, doesn't serve on a jury, perhaps in the course of their lifetime. It's still a part of who we are, and, and it functions as such. But there is a problem with advocating mini publics, these small random samples of the public, as the exclusive manifestation of this deliberative democratic transformation. It's essentially saying the jury is the correct solution to every question we might ask of ourselves. Well, the problem is it still only involves so many people. And it's true that people will, by osmosis, learn about that deliberation, respect it, and we've got lots of examples of people having high regard for these deliberative bodies, but we want some way to draw them in. Well, programs like the National Issues Forums have been bringing in hundreds of thousands of people through all kinds of public discussions. Uh, the deliberative poll is a mini-public, but the same person who proposed it, Jim Fishkin, celebrates the idea of a deliberation day every election cycle, where everyone is brought together with various incentives. We have kind of a deliberative holiday. Day. I do think it's important that some kind of deliberative experience should touch everyone, that everyone gets this chance to be in these relatively well-structured forums and so on. But I would remind us that those forums, those intensive face-to-face -face deliberative experiences, are a concentrated form of the kind of critical listening, the kind of respectful dialogue that we actually can have every day in less structured settings, whether we're having a conversation with friends or actually even if we're doing it through a, a mediated interface. Part of deliberation, after all, is listening. It's not just being in a forum. And you can get better at that every day and come to respect different points of view and be more reflective in the choices you make throughout your life. I think one of the best entry points for people who, who get interested in this idea of deliberation but want to get a better sense for what it is, I think they could participate in the Kettering Foundation's National Issues Forums, where you get a booklet that breaks down an issue into three choices, and you walk through those choices one by one. Even that, that simple experience of walking through the different choices and appreciating and hearing each of them gives you the sense 
that this issue you thought you had a clear position on is much more complex than you thought. And the people who disagree with you actually have put a fair bit of reflection into their own judgments. And you share values with them even if you're arriving at different policy uh, decisions. It doesn't necessarily change your mind, but it does change your mind about other people. And it changes your mind about the potential for deliberation. And it gives you a glimpse of the power of these kinds of processes, which can be distilled and crystallized into so many different forms. Thank you.